tonight inside a community inundated. <laughs> oh my God. They're taking stock of the damage near Montreal as water levels in Ottawa keep rising. I think it's gonna be a lot worse than the, the first time. What should the response be in the face of extreme weather? This is a case that keeps us up at night. The FBI says it's foiled a second attack in California days after a deadly shooting at a synagogue. Why both suspects named the terror in Christchurch as a motive. When it comes to safety, there are no competing priorities. After two crashes, tough questions, and a legal fight for Boeing. I was not there to help them. I couldn't save them. Why families of the victims say Boeing was blinded by greed. This is The National. Government officials and residents who know the Ottawa River well watch it very closely, especially this time of year. But in all the decades of seeing it surge and flood, no one has witnessed water levels quite like this. This is the Chaudière Bridge linking Ottawa and Gatineau. The sheer force of the water is frightening, and the bridge remains closed. In Gatineau itself, on the banks, the river has simply merged with the city. Upriver, water levels have reached historic levels here, here, and here. And the water's still rising. Officials expect the entire river to smash the record set by the previous flood just two years ago. But the trouble continues downriver too, where defenses gave way over the weekend when a dike collapsed here in the Montreal suburb of St. Marc sur le Lac. This is what it looks like now. Since Saturday, 6,500 people have been forced from these homes. Allison Northcott has the story of what they've witnessed as they return to the flood zone. <laughs> Seeing the damage for the first time was not easy. Valérie Delaurier kayaked into her home because there was that much water. I wasn't supposed to live this situation and yet here I am kayaking in my house with three, three feet of water in my living room. Thousands of people had to suddenly leave their home Saturday after a dike breached and water started pouring into the neighborhood, forcing out one third of the town's population. We moved as fast as we could. It was such a rush, it was like out of movie. After fleeing her home with her kids, Chrissy Gerard waded through hip deep water to return to it last night. I was okay until I walked into the house the first time and then I kind of just sat there and lost it because you don't know what to expect. Today, many residents were ready to try anything to get to their homes. Firefighters escorted people through flooded streets to grab personal belongings. Jacqueline Desbien was relieved her house is okay. But says the last days have been so hard. While some frustrated residents were stuck waiting behind police tape, police went door to door making sure homes in the evacuated area were empty, concerned about safety. The water is not clean, there's no electricity, and we don't know what's under the water, says Sergeant Marie-Pierre Laurent. The municipality was planning to reinforce the dike this fall. The province is now looking at other solutions too. What is important to say is that we will have to have a larger reflection on how do we prevent more floodings. The province says that includes moving people out of flood zones. The mayor says people in some areas can return to their homes tomorrow, but others will have to wait until the water recedes and that could take weeks. Alison Northcott, CBC News, St. Marthe, sur le lac Quebec. Now, in parts of the nation's capital, people are in a race against time to protect their homes. The Ottawa River is expected to peak in a few days. And one rural community in the city's west end is keenly aware of what could happen because they've lived that kind of devastation before. And I'm not just talking about flooding. Olivia Stefanovich shows us what they're up against. The word disaster is too familiar in Dunrobin. After fighting the historic flood in 2017, a tornado flattened parts of this neighborhood in 2018. And now, this. Yeah, you figure, well, that's enough. Yeah, two times is enough, but here we are, number three. So hopefully next year we'll have a good year. <laughs> that's all you can hope for, yeah. 
You can still see the scars that the tornado left behind. This used to be a strip mall. Still, neighbors aren't giving up on each other. I've never seen so many people help each other out. His family, the firemen, everybody. But down the street, the water is already winning. It's sad. I feel for them because they uh, they took a year to to get it back, and uh, they just basically moved in uh, late summer. And now, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a lot worse than the, the first time. The water is no match for the sandbag wall that Tony Eob helped build for his next door neighbors. Raw sewage now surrounds the home. Despite the hazard. Eob is willing to risk it, knowing his property could be next. Your mind goes because every hour you're waking up trying to figure out the, uh, you know, if your pumps are going and if the water is rising, you're always constantly looking at it. Emotions high, but spirits strong. I'll be here fighting until the power goes out. I've got a generator. As long as I can keep gas in that, I'm staying. There's no way in hell Mother Nature is going to beat me. As the community bands together, disaster after disaster. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. And Rosie, uh, we know there is a relationship between extreme weather and climate change, and that's not lost on the federal government. Yeah, Andrew, it is just six months to go until the federal election, and politicians here in Ottawa are using that very issue, not surprisingly, to attack one another. The floods have put the different parties' plans, those known and unknown, under scrutiny, and Salima Shivji has more on the clash over climate. <laughs> The army is out in force in three provinces. More soldiers responding to disasters here at home than overseas highlight the need for a longer-term solution. We're not just looking at response, we're looking at mitigating some of the effects uh, as well. That's just the uh, unfortunate reality that we live in now. A reality brought home by this devastation. The daily anguish has politicians pointing fingers over climate inaction. Today, we mark the one-year anniversary since the leader of the federal Conservatives, Andrew Scheer, promised that he'd be releasing his plan to fight climate change shortly. Well, it's a year later and we're still waiting. With emergency evacuations as a backdrop in Quebec this weekend, Scheer announced a date and little else. His climate plan will come in June. Our plan, as I mentioned, uh, will be unveiled with plenty of time for Canadians to analyze it, to evaluate it. Uh, but it has been quite some time since the Liberals promised their environmental plan, and today all we have is an ineffective carbon tax. A focus on the carbon tax and not climate policy that could hurt the Conservatives. The anti-carbon tax tactic worked in 2008 against Stéphane Dion. But a decade later, extreme weather events are now top of mind for many voters. That the Liberals have, I think, are successfully making climate change more of a voting issue, and the weather the climate is cooperating with them. So if the public thinks that this is a real issue, then woe be to the party that doesn't actually have a plan. And with the Liberals and Conservatives entrenched, the risk to other parties, their voices may be drowned out in the polarized climate debate. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. The Minister of National Defence said today that Ottawa will pick up the costs of deploying troops to those flood zones, assuring provinces that they will not be getting a bill from the military. In front of shareholders and then the media, Boeing's CEO today tried to shore up confidence in his company after the two 737 MAX plane crashes killed 346 people. He says Boeing is all about safety first, but there was a competing message. As Paul Hunter tells us, loved ones of some passengers from Canada say Boeing was blinded by greed. At the place where it happened in those awful days after the crash, agony for family members of those who'd flown from Canada on that Ethiopian Airlines Boeing 737 MAX 8. It will never leave me. It will never leave me. Today, seven weeks later, lawsuits from two of the families from Canada still grieving deeply. I was not there to help them. I couldn't save them. Paul and Jiroge's wife, three children and mother-in-law on that plane had lived in Hamilton. We have no closure, we have no peace and no answer. The loss for Hiral Vadia from Brampton, Ontario, her husband's parents, his sister, brother-in-law and two nieces. 
alleges the lawsuit all dead because Boeing put profit ahead of safety. They all died together because of the insensitivity and greed of the maker of a plane. We recognize the devastation to the families and friends of the passengers and crew members. Across town, Boeing's CEO met with shareholders today for the first time since the crash in Ethiopia and an earlier MAX 8 crash, a Lion Air flight off Indonesia. Investigators point to a faulty sensor causing both planes to nosedive. As one shareholder put it to Boeing today, We don't have to have 300 plus people die every time to find out that, that something is unreliable. Said Boeing, safety remains a priority, underlining no single factor brought down those jets. Pressed by reporters later on whether in light of it all he should resign. I think the important thing here again is we're very focused on safety and I can tell you that both of these accidents weigh heavily on us as a company. For those from Canada who today underlined they lost everything that mattered, unable even to retrieve the bodies of their families, all they really want now are answers. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Boeing is still working on the 737 MAX software update, which some think could come as early as next month. Still, Canadian airlines are feeling the pinch of all those grounded planes. Yesterday, WestJet announced it's suspending five routes starting June 3rd, including flights between Halifax and Paris and Edmonton and Ottawa. And last week, Air Canada announced more changes to its schedule, including having other airlines operate some of its international routes. As California reels from one deadly attack on a synagogue this past weekend, news today that another allegedly planned for the same weekend was thwarted. This one, police say, would have hit a Nazi rally south of Los Angeles. Its goal, mass murder. But as Kim Brunhuber tells us, this time police found out early enough to stop it. This is a case in which law enforcement was able to identify a man consumed with hate and bent on mass murder and stop him before he could carry out his attack. The FBI says 26-year-old Mark Domingo, an army veteran who served in Afghanistan, posted online supporting violent jihad. One of those posts, America Needs Another Vegas event, referring to the 2017 mass shooting there. Another, after the mosque attacks in Christchurch, said there must be retribution. The FBI noticed Domingo's posts and sent an informant to meet with him. Domingo reportedly mulled over various targets, Jews on their way to synagogue, police officers, churches, a military facility, the Santa Monica Pier, then allegedly settled on a plan. He would bomb a weekend rally in Long Beach with pressure cookers. He allegedly purchased several hundred three-inch long nails to be used in IEDs as shrapnel, specifically because the nails were long enough to penetrate the human body and puncture internal organs. On Friday, police say they arrested him as he surveyed his attack site. If successful, that attack would have taken place the same weekend as the synagogue shootings in Poway, California. That alleged gunman also posted online and claimed to be inspired by the Christchurch shootings. Today, the FBI say they got a tip about that attack, but it was too late. In a statement today, John Ernest's family said, Our son's actions were informed by people we do not know and ideas we do not hold. How our son was attracted to such darkness is a terrifying mystery to us. In Domingo's case, authorities proudly say the system worked. But what worries the most, Domingo's path to violence took just two months. Sometimes we get asked what keeps you up at night. This is a case that keeps us up at night. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. Now today, family, friends and supporters gathered to say goodbye to a woman killed in the synagogue shooting. Her name is Lori Kay. Today, you know, we want to we want to celebrate her life um, and we want to remember her and uh, thank God for the time that we that we had with her. Welcome. The synagogue was packed with those wounded in the attack also in attendance. There, Kay's daughter said that she knew her mother had already forgiven the man who took her life. The U.S.'s new envoy for combating anti-Semitism said that the Trump administration was, quote, at war with those committed to hate. The Ontario government announced today a sweeping review of problems plaguing Ontario's provincial police force. It comes after the Fifth Estate investigated a series of suicides of active and retired OPP officers, suicides that some say were triggered by a culture of bullying and harassment. Fifth Estate co-host Mark Kelly follows up on his initial story. 
When we last spoke to Robin Moore this winter, the OPP officer took us to the spot where he said he planned to kill himself. I didn't see any options out. Um, I was in that dark hole, and uh, I just I couldn't go through it anymore. Moore says he'd endured years of isolation and intimidation from fellow officers after turning in his boss for interfering in a criminal investigation. Today, Moore, now retired, is happy to be alive to hear the news of the OPP review. I would like to see people held accountable. I would like to see many people come forward and bring their stories forward and be able to tell them and, and receive help. The independent panel was triggered by tragedy. In three weeks last summer, three OPP officers took their own lives, and many blamed the deaths on what they call the toxic work culture inside Canada's second largest police force. I think we have to appreciate and be reminded that every time there is an OPP officer who commits suicide, uh, we, we have a failure as a government to act. Officer Josh DeBach was one of three officers to take his own life last summer. His wife Lon says the OPP doesn't protect the mental health of their own. I 100% believe he died because of his work and because of how he was treated there and neglected. The last external review of the OPP was done by Ontario's Ombudsman in 2012. He says the force ignored it. Since then, the Fifth Estate has learned 13 OPP officers have died by suicide. So I think the OPP can recover, but first off, they have to admit that there's an issue and then deal with it and then move forward. The newly appointed commissioner of the OPP, Thomas Carrick, says he welcomes the review and promises the full support of the force to help protect its members. Mark Kelly, CBC News, Toronto. Here's some of the other stories we're following tonight. The man who hired special counsel Robert Mueller has resigned. Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein handed in his letter of resignation to the U.S. president. He'll leave the post May 11th. Rosenstein had intended to leave last month, but stayed a little longer to help manage the public release of the Mueller report. I am highly confident that when the process plays out, that justice will be done. I appreciate it. Michael Avenatti formally pleaded not guilty to embezzlement and other charges in California today. Stormy Daniels' former lawyer is accused of stealing millions of dollars from clients who had been awarded settlements to pay his own expenses, also failing to pay taxes. Avenatti is facing separate charges in New York for allegedly trying to blackmail Nike. And still ahead on The National, is the Me Too movement leaving out an entire generation of women? And later, the strange case, the beluga spy whale. We'll explain that one in our moment. But first, one week after the Easter attacks in Sri Lanka, Susan Ormiston sits down with the country's prime minister and asks where things went wrong. Do you accept responsibility for that? I, I said yes, but it did not function. So therefore, we, we, we have to acknowledge the fact that the government machinery was faulty. For the first time in five years, the world's most wanted man has appeared on video. This is believed to be Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of the Islamic State. There have been numerous claims about his death over the past few years, but he appears to be in good health, still in hiding, and continuing his vendetta against the West. His call to violence was apparently answered on Easter Sunday when 250 people were killed in a series of attacks in Sri Lanka. Intelligence agencies issued a warning just days before, but no action was taken. Now, in an interview with Sri Lanka's Prime Minister, senior correspondent Susan Ormiston asks about the intelligence failure and what comes next. Sri Lanka is still in the grips of a terror watch. Security forces sweeping the country searching for any remnants of the extremist network. Do you believe there are people that are capable of carrying out another attack still within your country? Where the organization is broken, people are uh, on the run, but some of them do have explosives, and someone may, out of desperation, do an act, but this type of organized act, we cannot see at the moment. The Prime Minister confessed his greatest fear now is a lone ranger type, blowing himself up in a public place. The nets are closing in, and Let's hope and pray 
that the security forces succeed. One week on, many Sri Lankans are increasingly angry that the government failed to act on warnings from foreign intelligence that there could be an imminent attack. Prime Minister, do you accept the criticism that your government mishandled the security warnings? The security warnings were issued by the Minister of Defence to the relevant security agencies and the circulars went down. The real issue is why were they not implemented? But how is it that you didn't know? I mean, it begs the question, you are the Prime Minister of the country. That's, that's one of the things You that, are the yeah. head of the stability of this country. Yeah. No, it's, 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 I mean, it's a question that I and my mini and the ministers want to know. They were also not aware of it. And this is why, let's see what the committee, the new commission comes out with. But do you accept responsibility for that? I, I said yes, as a question. It did not function. So therefore, we, we, we have to acknowledge the fact that the government's machinery was faulty. Little comfort for so many grieving. Sri Lanka's archbishop today criticized top politicians for feuding while the country is in a crisis. Already the economy is slumping. The Tourism Bureau says travelers to Colombo will drop by 50% in the next two months. The prime minister believes tourism will recover. But now you would say don't come? Well, we are not saying not to come, neither are we pushing them to come. It's up for them to look at the travel advisories. But you can't reassure tourists that this is safe and stable now? No, we would tell them you have to take your own decision, but in the next few weeks we will stabilize the situation and then we can look forward for the next tourist season in August. Much depends on whether the government can hold the country together without dipping back into ethnic or religious violence. Everyone is worried, but we've gone through this before, so let's get into it, but let's hope we get out of it quickly. Thank you very much, Prime Minister, for your time, and we wish you the best for this country and for peace. Thank you. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Colombo. Still ahead on The National, painting a picture of survival, one artist's efforts to capture the stories and faces behind them before it's too late. And the Me Too era has led to more awareness around sexual violence, but when it comes to the most vulnerable, is enough being done? Does it feel like Me Too left women like your mom, their age, behind? Completely, completely. They, they, were, they were believable. They, they they were shattered by what had happened to them and that could be seen uh, in interviewing them or speaking to them or watching their statement. You could see that. That's an investigator of sexual assault allegations speaking with the CBC's Diana Swain. The allegations ultimately did not lead to a conviction. The Me Too movement may have heightened awareness of sexual violence, even empowered some women to speak out. But as Diana shows us, for the elderly, the Me Too revolution can seem a lifetime away. So this is the Sicily housing program. Program manager Aishima Harris is giving us a tour inside a safe house for women in Vancouver. Hey, Jenna, I didn't know you were here. <laughs> it's a home exclusively for older women. We have women here who are 75, 76. Some have come to escape physical violence, some floor. sexual abuse. So we are staff 24-7. Uh, this is our front desk. It gives them a safe place to stay and help navigating the legal system. We're the ones they come and brainstorm to see, okay, what step do I take next? Where do I go? How do I access this? Tomorrow when you come in, there's a couple issues that we need to deal with. Kim Corbett has worked with several elderly women. She says the justice system often seems ill-prepared for them. I have seen women with dementia, women with lower cognitive functioning or um, developmental disabilities, I can say that they are, they are much more preyed upon than higher functioning women and it happens to them a lot more and nobody believes them. 
women's stories of sexual assault are being talked about now like never before. But there are reasons to wonder if Me Too's focus on younger women has done anything for those who are arguably more vulnerable. Making faces for the camera? Always. It's a selfie. From her home just north of Toronto, Eva Sherdan is describing her mother, Sonia. She was amazing. She was one meter, 54 centimeters, and the biggest hero I could have ever known or seen. Reading all the time, she was the only one in the nursing home who came with so many books and dictionaries. In 2015, Sonia was moved to a nearby hospital to treat pneumonia. She wasn't there long before returning to her nursing home, but her family says she was changed. What change did you notice in her? She wasn't herself at all, at, at all. Even her facial expressions, everything wasn't there. She didn't communicate. Roughly two months after her mother had been discharged, hospital administrators asked Eva to come to a meeting. It never occurred to you what they were <gasps> about to tell you. Never in my life. Hospital staff revealed they believed her mother had been sexually assaulted by a healthcare worker during her stay. I'm still shocked every time that I think about it. I don't want to, to analyze all the details. Did she ever talk to you about what happened? Never, but every time a man came to the room, even month later, a year later, she put her hands over her breast, shaking like this. The personal care worker insisted his attempts to do intimate cleaning had simply been misunderstood. But several more incidents involving elderly patients were reported by hospital workers. He was fired and eventually charged with sexually assaulting five women, all of them in their 80s and 90s. We were definitely working with the fact that we had a strong case. That's what we believed. Detective Lori Perks was in charge of the investigation. How difficult is it to put together a case involving an elderly victim? Is there any signs of dementia? Is that going to be affected uh, in your investigation long term? Will their memory change? We can get around that with the elderly with a sworn uh, video statement form. Um, and that is used in uh, the event that something does happen to your victim. Did you have those in this case? We did. Some of the alleged victims identified by the hospital talked to police. Sonia wasn't one of them. She had virtually stopped talking by then. Those that did made clear how they felt. You know, they, they, were, they were believable. They, they, they were shattered by what had happened to them. And that could be seen uh, in interviewing them or speaking to them or watching their statement, you could see that. But the trial ended before it could begin, and age appears to be part of the reason. Sonia Sherdan died two months earlier. She was 91. The Crown, citing the complainant's frailties and other difficulties with the case, withdrew the charges of sexual assault. The judge accepted a single guilty plea for a slap. The worker admitted he gave another elderly woman. He received a conditional discharge and no criminal record. I feel that I'm still in shock. Were you ever told why they didn't go ahead? We asked him, how did you close it? And he said, it's a part of the system. The victims were frail. And he said, you have to understand it. This is the system. You know, you do think about your parents or your grandparents um, and how that would have affected them or how would you feel, you know, trying to be an advocate for your parent or your grandparent in that situation. Obviously, I would have liked to see a different outcome. Uh, I don't have control over that. The problem for older women is that they're not seen as targets of sexual assault at all. UBC law professor Janine Benedet co-authored a study looking at two decades of cases of sexual assault involving older women. It found those cases that made it to trial were often the very extreme. Cases less clear-cut rarely made it that far. 
What was so striking about the cases we saw that uh, were actually going to court was how much they looked like sexual assault cases involving younger women that would have been prosecuted in the 1960s and 1970s before we had uh, you know, a, a complete re-examination of how pervasive sexual assault was and who was actually committing it. And it was as if the sexual assaults against older women were somehow frozen in time. Benedette believes while society is inclined to take women's stories more seriously now than it once did, that's still not true for elderly women. We need to recognize that um, if we aren't willing to proceed with cases involving highly vulnerable victims, just because they may have difficulty testifying, just because our criminal trial process wasn't really designed with them in mind, that those victims become the perfect targets. We're just going to get you mic'd up and then we'll use Rana Ambrose believes she may have part of the remedy. We don't have a problem with our law. We have a problem with the way that it is being implemented in our court system. The leader of the opposition. She was once the federal conservative leader. Before she left politics, Ambrose tried to make a change to the way lawyers and judges are trained. As you know, I uh, introduced a private member's bill to mandate sexual assault training uh, for judges. We have judges that are former corporate lawyers, former energy sector lawyers that are now presiding over sexual assault cases. And these are extremely complex cases. When we hear about Me Too, yeah. there hasn't been much conversation around older women. There's this idea that if a woman is older, well, you know, why would somebody rape them? But that gets back to this idea that rape is about sex. It's not. It's about power and violence. The training is about that. It's about understanding all of these dynamics around sexual assault, the stereotypes, the bias that comes with it, and really having a comprehensive view of the impact on the victim. The bill flew through the House of Commons, but has been stalled in the Senate for nearly two years by some who've told her it's an overreaction to Me Too. We just have to keep pushing and trying to make the case that those are, that are trying to block it, that this is important. Why does this matter to you so much? You know much? what? There's so many people that I've worked with on this bill. And, you know, I could list the stakeholders, the Natives Women's Association of Canada, the London Abuse Centre. I mean, women's groups <laughs> makes me emotional, actually. And so many survivors. It's, it's been to hear their stories. And these guys... I mean, they have treat, like they've been dismissive, disrespectful, ignorant to me. Well, how are these women going to get anywhere with them? Right. Does it feel like Me Too left women like your mom, their age, behind? Completely, completely. And it's not about old women only. It's about all the helpless. Neither the judge nor the Crown in the case would talk about the decision to withdraw the charges. The conditional discharge the personal care worker received expires next year, and he'll be able to work with elderly patients again. But the very serious allegations about what may have happened to Sonia and others have simply faded away with them. Diana Swain, CBC News, Toronto. Ahead on the National, capturing stories of survival by one Canadian artist is working to preserve the past. These Holocaust survivors are aging, and within another decade or so, there probably won't be any of them left, and those first-hand experiences will be lost. But first, John Singleton is being remembered tonight as a trailblazer, a cinematic king. The Oscar-nominated writer and director died today after suffering a massive stroke. Yo, what's your problem, man? Y'all are brothers. You're supposed to be fighting each other. John Singleton rose to fame in 1991 with his debut film, Boys in the Hood, about a community grappling with gang violence and poverty. It was based on Singleton's own experience growing up in South Central L.A. The picture has so much um, emotional impact and resonance because, it, tragically, there are a lot of people who have been in that position. The nominees are John Singleton for Boys in the Hood. It earned him an Oscar nod for Best Director, making him the, the first African-American and at just 24, the youngest person to be nominated in that category. In that film and several that followed, Singleton brought hip-hop to Hollywood by casting musicians like Ice Cube, Tupac, and Janet Jackson in lead roles. Most rap artists are not who they are, uh, you know, in terms of the show business thing. There's, there's a private life. There's like, they're acting, they're acting anyway. Singleton suffered a stroke two weeks ago. Today, his family announced they had made the agonizing decision to remove him from life support. 
They said in part, John was such a supernova in his youth that we forget that he was only beginning to fully assert his gifts as a director. John Singleton was 51. We are here today to reiterate our demand for the return of the Canadian garbage that has been dumped in the Philippines for over six years now. Protesters took to the streets of Manila today, once again calling on Canada to deal with a load of garbage. Six years ago, a Canadian company shipped more than 100 containers to the Philippines, saying they were filled with recyclable plastics. Instead, they mostly contained household trash. The protests come as the UN conference looking at hazardous waste disposal gets underway. We have got to get a handle on these outbreaks or the measles will get a foothold and be a permanent problem with the results being disastrous. Officials in New York trying to convince more people to get vaccinated for measles. They're now pushing to remove religious exemptions for students who haven't been immunized. Across the country, more than 700 cases have been reported, the most the U.S. has seen in 25 years. It's not up to the Attorney General to tell the committee how to conduct his business. We've told him we expect him to show up on Thursday. The chair of the U.S. House Judiciary Committee making it clear that William Barr must testify this week about the Russia investigation. The Attorney General is scheduled to appear before the committee on Thursday, but has suggested he may not show up. Barr has raised concerns about the format, which includes a closed session to discuss classified sections of the Mueller report. A Saskatoon artist is using her portraits to examine two groups that suffered through oppression. In a way, she's bringing them face to face. So what are the parallels between Jews who went through the Holocaust and indigenous people who were forced as children into residential schools? Bonnie Allen shows us one artist's vision. I think that all of us are under the delusion that we can hide who we are from people, but I think that everything is in their faces. Every face tells a story, and for decades, Carol Wiley has been painting those stories. Three years ago, the painter attended this Holocaust memorial service. The story of an 88-year-old survivor triggered a sense of urgency to capture more stories on canvas. I was so moved by it, and I'm of Jewish heritage myself, and thought that I, these Holocaust survivors are aging, and within another decade or so, there probably won't be any of them left, and those first-hand experiences will be lost. She began to paint Holocaust survivors across Canada. They shared their stories with her, as some have done publicly before. My humanity, my name as a human being, erased. Robbie Wiseman was sent to a concentration camp when he was 13. Life afterwards became a struggle. We had to learn how to laugh and how to cry. We didn't know how. We were so dehumanized. Not long after Wiley began her project, she was offered Indigenous awareness training at her Saskatoon workplace. She learned how an estimated 150,000 children had been taken from their parents and placed in Indian residential schools. The intent was assimilation, not annihilation, but still Wiley was struck by some of the similarities between survivors. They cut hair when they entered the residential schools and the, the concentration camps, their hair was cut, they were assigned numbers, and these are, all, these are all methods of othering and dehumanizing people. So this is uh, Louise. So she decided to expand her project. And then this is Eugene Arcand. Cree elder Eugene Arcand was sexually abused in residential school and lived in shame for decades. Arcand recently shared his story alongside a Holocaust survivor, a joint effort to educate young people. But he worries history is too easily dismissed. He applauds Wiley for confronting the horrors of the past and legacies of pain. Courageous woman to do what she's done here and accept the truth. Stop avoiding the truth. Wiley has painted 18 portraits, half from each group. Sadly, as she feared, a couple have already passed away, including Holocaust survivor Bill Gleed. Those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. 
But she's hopeful the portraits and lessons will live on. If we can build some compassion that way to understand that every person feels pain the way that we do, maybe as a, as a society or as a human race, we will be a little more reluctant to inflict that kind of suffering. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Up next on The National, you'll meet the beluga whale with one strange backstory. I asked him, is it a kind of fishing gear? He was like, no, there's some kind of harness. And then it gets even weirder. Wait until you find out who the whale belonged to. That's next in our moment, but first. In case you missed it, the Simpsons tried to laugh at Canada last night by dragging out a metric ton of old stereotypes. A Mountie, a beaver, maple syrup, asbestos. Oh, and hockey, of course. I must keep you in Canada where you'll be safe and assigned your own hockey team. Please not Ottawa, please not Ottawa. The senators tweeted an understated response, and Justin Trudeau ignored this political pope. I could just ask you one question about the SNC-Lavalin scandal. But some Canadians did get angry online. Facebook ignited as soon as uh, the episode was over, so kind of everyone in Newfoundland kind of clicked on Facebook and everyone knew. Here's the offending segment. Stupid Newfies. I'm a Newfie. Whee! Well, the first thing I didn't like, it was it was a young pup. Uh, the other thing was they were clubbing it. Um, you haven't been able to club seals in a long, long time, and we haven't been able to kill baby seals since 1987. Landers, Others on the streets of St. John's didn't seem to care. It's just in good fun, I think. I don't think we should take it too personally. After so many seasons on the air, maybe the joke is now on The Simpsons. Did you watch the episode last night? No, I watch Game of Thrones like everyone else. <laughs> This is CBC News. What makes it news to you? One small step for man. Is it something that tugs at your heart? The Constitution is now home. Or opens your eyes. The Berlin Wall is coming down. If the story matters to you, your community. Fires burning across the province. Or the entire world. We're going to build a wall. You can always turn to us. CBC News, right where you are. Drag is my political statement. Let's make a scene. Drag is about creating safe spaces. I didn't choose how I felt. I only had a choice to do something about the way that I felt. I want them to love me. I want them to love drag. Have you heard the good news? What are you talking about? You can stream hundreds of shows on CBC Gem. What? And it's free. Unbelievable. CBC Gem. Start streaming now. So this may look like your average beluga whale, but in reality, it's got quite the backstory and it may have been on a mission. So let me explain. Norwegian fishermen spotted it and they noticed something strange about the whale. You might have got a glimpse of it there. Mounts for cameras. And they think they have an idea who's behind it. We spoke to one of the marine biologists who was there and that is our moment. Hey, hey. The whale was found by a fisherman. He told us that it went swimming towards his boat and he was swimming around the boat, wanted to seek uh, contact. I asked him, is it a kind of fishing gear? And he was like, no, there's some kind of harness. <laughs> the first thing uh, I was thinking that it's a really beautiful animal and uh, has this uh, French harness, harness on it. When we read the uh, equipment St. Petersburg, our first instinct was that this animal uh, wants our help. We tried to get it off, and I grabbed some really fresh and nice pod fillet. That, uh, I tried to feed it to him, and my colleague uh, in the unit, we tried to uh, release the, one of the clips, but the whale went down. Sometimes there are packs of um, uh, white whales that come down, down to the coast here in Norway, and I hope it will join one of the pods and go up to the Arctic and be free again. So I guess this whale was some sort of Russian spy. 
<laughs> well, well, that, who decided he had had enough. <laughs> yeah. He decided he had had enough. Right. <laughs> it, it, so it, it does kind of raise the question, though, right? Like, I mean, wh why, why would you stick cameras t to a, a whale? I, you know, exploration is, is potentially one answer. Uh, that marine, marine biologist had some other theories, you know, that, that the whale could have been trained to deliver explosives, to defend naval bases, even to fetch things that they may have dropped oh. underwater. It's fascinating. Mm. We have to commit to stay on this story because I think we're going to discover more, maybe even within a matter of days, because it's either the sinister post-Cold War use of a whale against its will as a spy, yes, or maybe it's just scientists who are following the whale migration patterns with a couple of GoPros. And no, have the some spy story. Let's go with the spy footage. story. <laughs> You're convinced. <laughs> we'll find out. That is The National for April 29th. Good night. Good night. Bye.